in this session, session four, we're going to look at this massive vision of millions, yes, billions of God's people mobilized on a one-of-a-kind masterpiece mission to where they live, work, study, and play. How in the world would the church organize for that kind of crazy, decentralized, bottom-up movement without strangling it or turning it into concrete? And his church leaders were pretty good at turning stuff into concrete sometimes. So the theme of Ephesians 4 provides the answer. And the theme in this session is simply this. We are called to do more. This promise to do more of the church becoming this revolutionary, unstoppable movement, filling everything in every way. If we're honest, most of the time, our experience of church doesn't really measure up to this. Like the revolutionary fights that we're experiencing in our church a lot of times are like people fighting over who gets what room what night in the building or we're putting in new carpet in the sanctuary and there's a fight over what the color is going to be. Are you with me? I mean, people fighting about conflict in their small group and it's like, man, there's this big gap between where we are and, and where God's called us to be and what is it? I mean, what in the world is stopping us from becoming this revolutionary unstoppable movement? And a key piece of that we discover in this constitutional book of Ephesians, especially chapter 4, where Paul begins to uh, unveil for us this original design that is inextricably woven into the release of the body of Christ into more. So if you have your Bibles with you, would you look at Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 11? And it says this, so Christ himself gave, this is the gift of Jesus to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach all unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. And what's the end game? Attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And here's the big idea for this session. The church is called to do more. And Jesus has given gifts, these master gifts, these different roles to help organize the church for fullness, for impact, for mobilization. And if we aren't willing to embrace the form of organizing gifts that Jesus has given to us, we will never fill every crook and nanny of society with his fullness. And here's the correlating move in this session. We need to organize for fullness. So that begs the question, what's going on here in Ephesians chapter 4? What is the organization that releases this kind of fullness? How in the world do we do that? But before we go to the how, let's remember the why. Why did Jesus give this specific set of master gifts to the church? I mean, was it so that we could be, you know, self-actualized and have a sense of personal fulfillment? I mean, those are nice side benefits, But Paul is very clear about the purpose of these gifts. It's so that the church, he says, might be built up. And why is the church, what's the purpose of it being built up? So that it might reach unity and that it might become mature. And then the climax, the crescendo is this, that we will reach the measure of the fullness of Jesus. And What we see here again is this theme of fullness that Paul comes back to again and again and again in the book of Ephesians, this vision of fullness. And there's actually three layers of fullness that Paul refers to in the book of Ephesians that are the why. And we need to see this again because this is the call to more. It's all about fullness. Now, when I was a kid, I grew up in the south side of Chicago. And there was this famous cake that was made at this bakery near where I lived. It was called the Atomic Cake. And it had three different layers. There was like a chocolate layer, and then there was this other layer that was like 10,000 calories of chocolate pudding, cream cheese, anyone getting hungry, whipped cream. And then there was this vanilla layer at the top, and it was humongous. And they called it the Atomic Cake, because when you ate it, it was like an atomic bomb hit your body. And children would just vibrate with a sugar high, you know? And what Paul reveals to us here is a three-layer cake of fullness in the book of Ephesians. It is like an atomic bomb of fullness that would literally make the whole world quiver, and it will. 
Because Jesus is building his church. He's going to get this done. And I want you to see these three layers of fullness because it's the why behind the how. The first layer he's talking about in the book of Ephesians is a universal fullness. In Ephesians chapter 1, again, we see his vision of Jesus, that he is not just the Galilean incarnating in flesh and blood at one point in time and one place in history, that he is now the resurrected Christ. He is the cosmic Christ. He's feeling everything in every way. We don't have to carry a little Jesus wherever we go to bring them Jesus. Hello, Jesus is already there. He's already at work before we ever show up. And get this, he is the Lord of all. He's already the Lord of every home where you live. He is already the Lord of every bar, of every business, wherever you live. He is the Lord of all. And there's this universal fullness of the resurrected Christ. Wherever we show up, Jesus is there. And that's done. Because he conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave, both now and forevermore. I don't know if you've heard, he's risen, he's alive. He is the cosmic Christ. And that promise is fulfilled in Jesus. That's the first layer, the universal fullness. Secondly, the second layer, there is personal fullness. And again, in Ephesians 3, we see this vision of the fullness filling every single one of the people of God. He says, I pray that your inner being would be filled, that that Christ would dwell in the images of Jesus dwelling us, just sitting down inside of us, filling every nook and cranny. He says, I pray that you'll be rooted like a tree with your roots going down into the nutrients and just yielded and pulling in the light of this fullness and that you would be grounded In Ephesians 3, we see that there's this personal fullness. Come on, we can't carry the fullness of Jesus to every nook and cranny until we let the fullness of Jesus grow in us. It can't get through us until it's in us. So there's the universal fullness, then there's the personal fullness. And the layer three that we're going to see in Ephesians 2 and also here in Ephesians 4 is what you could call ecclesial fullness. The body of Christ cannot reach its fullness unless the entire body is participating. Can I get an amen? It's about activating every single follower of Jesus, every disciple. Why would we think the fullness of Jesus could be carried into every corner of society without every single person being activated on mission? And this is where Ephesians 2 and Ephesians 4 come in. In Ephesians 2, Paul shows us again that every single person has been designed by God as a masterpiece with a -a one-of-a-kind masterpiece mission of personal calling. And then in Ephesians 4, we see this, this set of master giftings that organize the body in a way that will unlock and unleash billions of masterpiece missions. And so mobilizing God's people God's way, we must first understand the reason and the design for that is this universal, personal, and ecclesial fullness to be unleashed. So that gets us to then the how. I mean, if that's the why, that's a good why. Is that a big enough why? It is for me. So then what's the how? Well, let's start with what Jesus didn't do. He didn't give us a very prescriptive formula. You know, here's the Ten Commandments of how to organize your church. What he does in Ephesians, though, is he tells us that he's given us vitally important gifts that when they are fully activated and respected, that these five influencing styles will again, empower the church to reach its full potential. And here's what's really cool about these five specific roles that we see in Ephesians 4. Not only are they essential in the church, they're really essential in the whole created order. I mean, these are the roles that you would need in any organization if it's going to flourish and reach fullness. So let's just walk through these real quickly, just brief definitions. First of all, there's the apostle who extends and expands. And if you're in any organization that you want to scale and grow beyond its current limits, you need apostle types, you need pioneers, you need entrepreneurs. Then there's the prophet. This is the one who questions and critiques. These are the ones that keep us true to our vision. They keep us true to our values. They they remind us of our moral compass. And every organization needs someone to help us stay true. And that's the role of the prophet. And then there's the evangelist. And this is the one who recruits to the cause. These are these uh, naturally infectious people, and they can enlist raving fans. And they are the ones in our context as the church that are so powerfully gifted in, in proclaiming the gospel and inviting and including new people. But every organization needs the evangelist to, to, to spread the word and invite others in. And then what about the shepherd? 
That's the caretaker. This is, these are the people that nurture community and care to make sure that task doesn't trump relationships, that guide and, and provide that nurturing that everybody needs. And who wants to be in an organization that doesn't have that kind of nurturing? And then finally is the teacher who explains and organizes you know, these are the, the engineers, the project managers. They know how to bring truth to practice. They know how to bring integrity. They know how to enable processes and systems that make the truth uh, action and impact. And isn't Jesus' design brilliant? It's brilliant. And if you think about the person of Jesus, he functioned in all of these. And we'll look at that in just a few moments when Alan comes up. But here's what I want us to notice right now. I know that words and definitions matter. And there continues to be a great difference of opinion within the church over the fivefold gifts in Ephesians 4. Some wonder, were they only for the early church? You know, were the apostolic and prophetic giftings only for the first century? Were these five gifts only reserved for just a few people who then equip others? Or, or is the entire church blessed with a spectrum of these functional gifts that maybe aren't quite as linear as we're laying them out to be? There's the questions of sensation Ism and also continualism that's debated year after year. And we're not likely to resolve these in perfect unity in this environment. But I want to invite us to a place of unity. I know that we all agree that God has gifted every one of his children with gifts and callings. Agreed? And wouldn't it make sense that Jesus would provide an organizing system to most effectively mobilize those people? So let's come together on the higher ground of seeing the fivefold as organizing systems in the body of Christ. We're not going to consider them to be offices or even supernatural gifts like sign gifts, like miracles or speaking in tongues, but rather as organizing systems in the body of Christ. Right now, you have numerous systems that are operating inside of your physical body. You've got a respiratory system system, a digestive system, a circulatory system, and so forth. And as long as those systems are operating in harmony, you have health, you have growth, you have fullness. If one of those systems gets out of kilter, you have disease. disease. If two of them go out, you're going to go to the doctor. If three are out, you're in the ER. If four are out, it's lights out. Time for a funeral, right? And I want to ask you within your church, your congregation, how many of the five systems are actually functioning with strength and health in this synergistic and interdependent way? Because that's the genius of Jesus' design. Dr. Paul in Ephesians 4 describes the body of Christ. And he says, there's an apostle system. There's a prophet system. There's an evangelist system, a shepherd system, a teaching system. And all of these systems co-mingle and they work together and they organically create health. And they will unleash the people of God into every nook and cranny. And God has big plans for his body. In fact, Dr. Paul says this body's going to get so big, it's going to fill everything everywhere with the fullness of Jesus and in order for the body to grow that big, we need to keep all five systems in balance. So in the rest of the session, first of all, Alan Hirsch, he's going to unpack in greater detail how we can use these five systems as an organizing tool. It's not a prescriptive formula, but how do we see this as a matrix, an organizing tool? And then Brian Sanders from Tampa Underground, they've uh, been operating inside of this system for years and it's truly unleashing movement over 200 micro churches that are beginning to fill the nooks and crannies of Tampa and it's grown to uh, I think what 13 different cities around the world. I, I, I do represent a new kind of a new construction of the church as a missionary community. And the underground is, is a phenomenon in the sense that it is a family of autonomous Micro churches called to plant the church in places where it's most needed and least represented. And we do that in utterly unique contexts and populations. But if the underground is meant to be considered today as a, as a case study for APEST, which is maybe what we'll take a couple of minutes here to think about, then we must first talk about descending, descending into that place of conflict and threat and darkness, pain to go there. This is why these gifts were given to us. And I think our people are remarkable, not just because of their entrepreneurial spirit, while that is, that is something, but because of their courage, actually, to rush into the fray. 
So we make up this missionary family that is both the church in its smallest form, but also in a larger form. We are, we are not structured the same, probably, as, as a conventional church. And so when we think about leadership and how, about how something like Ephesians 4 applies to us, we also think about it a little bit differently. So I want to encourage you not to just think about APES in terms of your leadership team, so sort of a pastoral team of four or five people or the executive function of your centralized church. That is fine. That is good. I suppose that, that, that is a way in which the fullness of Jesus can be worked out in that small team. But I actually think that's thinking too small about how and where this works itself out. And those of you who lead the macro expression of the church or some kind of city network or something like that, I want to, I'm going to propose that the real leadership team of your church are not those people, no offense, but they're, they're actually the people leading in the front line of its mission. They're the people that are actually the ones stepping into the fight somewhere. That's your leadership team. Expanding the boundaries of the kingdom, that's your leadership team. Now, if you start thinking about that, then it's more important that we see APEST at work in that team than we see it at work in the servants or the administrators for whom God has called to serve them. Because these gifts, these five gifts, reflect the fronts on which we fight. They reflect the fronts on which we fight. For the apostle, it is that, that unsurrendered ground. For the prophet, it is, it is injustice. Something is wrong. For the evangelist, it is unbelief. For the shepherd, it is brokenness. For the teacher, it is ignorance or falsehood. These are the fronts on which we fight. Interestingly enough, uh, I should, you know, at full disclosure, I should probably say that we, we, we don't organize around APEST. We don't, we don't lead toward APEST, but it could not be more important to us. We've just given people freedom, actually. This, this, is, this is actually quite remarkable. We just give people freedom to organize themselves. We've sent them back into the presence and the voice of God to find out what they're supposed to do with their lives and said, we're here to help you once you know and once you've heard and once you're ready to enter the fight somewhere. We're here. And the result of that, freedom, is an undeniable affirmation, not just of a pest, but of the very real presence of Jesus as the head of his church. John's vision was right, you know, with the fiery-eyed, you know, burning Jesus who tends, walks among the lampstands of his church. That's what he's doing. So here's the thing, guys. You, you're not the leaders of the church. I know you think you are. I know you were told you were. I know you went to school for it. But you're not. You are its servants. If I, if I take a handful of marbles, and I, I, I don't have a handful of marbles because I don't plan ahead well enough for these moments, but if I had a handful of marbles and I threw them in the air, releasing them, can you just work with me? Can you imagine that? Just if I, if I took a handful of marbles, threw them in the air, releasing them, the invisible reality of gravity would assert itself as the governing principles of, principle of those marbles. A tangible force at work. But first I must let them go. And so the release of leadership in the church from the grasp of overbearing human leaders reveals the very real assertion of Jesus as the head of his church and the Lord of his people. We have to let him go. We have to relinquish control. And if we will do that, then suddenly we see that he is there, always was there. Uh, I think the word Alan used was latent. These gifts are latent. They're already there. They're, they, 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 have to be, they have to be let go. The people have to be let go. And then you'll see that Jesus was always there ready to lead his church. That it, 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 was, it was we who were muzzling him, reining him in, suffocating his people. I mean, on their own, these, these gifts are worthwhile, even heroic, but taken together, they reveal something extraordinary, something potent, something, something formidable, something that really, when you see it all together, this sort of gestalt thing, when you see it all together, it takes your breath away. 
I mean, the church, guys, we have to stop thinking of the church as an organism. The, the church is a super organ. If you think of bi biology, the church is a, a super organism. That's some sort of group of, of synergistically interacting organisms of the same species. That's a super organism. Here's the thing about a super organism. It cannot be controlled and it cannot be killed. We need to stop thinking of the church as a business to be managed. And we have to think of it as a force to be released. Stop thinking with the mindset of scarcity and think of the mindset of abundance. We have to see, uh, you know, that the, the, the church is a fire to be set. And APES is the form of that fire. It's the form that that fire takes. So I think of, in my own city, I think of our own network, I think of Derek, who didn't just start a church in a bar. He helped start six. And he hopes, if you ask him, he hopes and plans and leads and dreams and works to see, to see people in every bar in Tampa reading the Bible together and taking Jesus seriously, talking about Jesus in every bar in Tampa. That's what he wants. Because the apostles dream of more. I think of Brent, uh, whose team is challenging legislators in our state to protect women and men who have been sold and bought and trafficked through our state. Or Jillian, who, who leads a church for vulnerable women exploited and demeaned by the sex industry. Or, 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 or Evie and Will, who lead a church for young black boys and young black girls confronting 200 years of racism, clouding their little mental skies because the prophets dream of justice. I think of Josh and Adriana working on the campuses of our cities so that every student will have a chance to meet Jesus for themselves and a chance to respond to his good news and the good news of his kingdom that he promised this world. And they want to see the entire, all of our universities transformed by the proclamation of the gospel because the evangelist's dream of faith. I think of Jane or George or Mark, and I could go on, or Leanne, people who have planted churches to the wounded who want more than anything to confront the brokenness inside people, to see, to see hearts and minds healed and the world transformed one life at a time because shepherds dream of wholeness. And I think of Ryan, people like Ryan or, or, or Anthony who open their homes every week and, you know, convening church around learning, thinking, dialogue, helping people who do not know the story or the way of Jesus uh, uh, confront the lies in their lives and the lies in their head. And, and, and helping people learn and be liberated by that knowledge. Teachers dream of setting people free with the truth. And there are dozens of stories I could tell you for each one. To be precise, and I will be precise, there are 32 I could tell you of the 200 microchurches in, in, in our city that, we, that are part of our family. There are 32 that would be apostolic and, and about 34 that would be prophetic and about 46 that would be evangelistic and 52 that would be shepherding and 36 that would be teaching. And I think that's actually kind of remarkable because the underground is not just an, ex an example of empowerment, it's a witness to the will of God. It's actually a witness to the, to the reality of the headship of Jesus over his church if you just let him go. What they end up planting looks a lot like apes. If you just say, okay, you belong to Jesus, uh, don't ask us what to do, <laughs> what do I look like? Are my eyes on fire? I don't think so. So uh, uh, look away. Look to him for the answers of your life. Where to go? We're here to serve you. But we're, what is it that he's called you to do? If you just let people do that, and you stop asking them to come to things that don't help them go there, all of a sudden, this is how it looks. So when we look at all of these expressions of the church, all of these plants that, 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 we're, that are part of our family, they look a lot like apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers. This is how we see that symmetry that Alan is talking about. If you want to look for a pest or balance, don't, don't just look for it on your ministry team or your leadership team. Look for it in your missionary engagement. And even that's not really something you can manage or mastermind. The equilibrium of a pest is not, in my opinion, meant to be something we only look for in small little units, but it should be something that expresses itself in the missionary impulse of, of our whole community. In June 19, 2008, a woman named Esmond Green was feeling sick and ill and short of breath, and so she went to Kings County Hospital, checked in and waited in the waiting room for 24 hours, sat in a chair for 24 hours. You can watch this viral footage, you can, you can watch it on YouTube, because there was a camera ca capturing 
Esmond as she, at the end of that 24-hour period, convulsed, slumped over, slid to the floor, laid on her face, and died. And what's shocking is that she lay there dead for one hour as people walked by, as people were in the waiting room, as a security guard. You can watch the footage of it. It's chilling. As a security guard just watched her lay there. Sociologists call this the bystander effect. It's when, it's when some great uh, uh, tragedy or, or problem is happening in front of us, but because of the context, usually because there's too many people around, we think that doesn't have to do with me. I, there's nothing I'm supposed to do about that. And something about a hospital, maybe even, I, I, I can only assume that the people sitting there and the, and the security guard and the people that are passing by think, well, this is a hospital. Hospitals are supposed to do this. And that's the problem is that we have this presumption that the church is something that's going to sort of take care of social evils or is going to co- sort of confront the world and all of its need. But the truth is the church is us. It's always been us. It isn't someone else. It's the one looking upon the problem. And the only time you ever see the bystander effect not apply is when no one else is around. It's when, it's when if, if, Esmond, if Esmond Green falls down in front of any of those people alone in an alley or in a street, they know implicitly, they know I'm responsible for this. I have to do something. Surely God would want me to help this woman. And yet something about creating a hospital, that, that environment of a hospital, we, we think our churches are more like hospitals, and we think somehow mission is something that we've, 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 we've sort of outsourced to the, 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 to the professionals or outsourced to the system itself or to the programs. And the truth is all that has to be taken back. We have to take that back. This whole text begins because of the grace that was given as Christ apportioned it. Even that work of caring for this woman, of seeing her not die alone, is grace. It's grace not just to her, it's grace also to us. For God who said, let light shine in darkness, has made His light to shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ Jesus. Amen.